Hi, this is a brief review of Paleolithic art, so art running from about 30,000 to 9,000 BCE, focusing primarily on the area of Europe, modern day Europe. So, uh, Paleolithic literally means old stone, so Paleo old, Litho stone, old stone age. Uh, it's prehistoric, remember this is a period before writing, so there are no written records from this period. We have the archaeology, we have these objects that we interpret as art, but that's really all we have to go from. So we have some ideas of what they ate, some ideas of the tools they had, but it's very, very limited just because this time period um, so, so long ago, so very little does survive. The materials they used were stone shell, ivory, so things that were naturally occurring um, were not to the period where people are using bronze or iron, so that's going to come later on. Um, there's an emphasis on animals and hunting, so of course people are hungry during this period. They do not have a lot of food available. They are not raising their own animals at this point. They are not raising their own crops. There's not a, night, a period of, um, they don't have agriculture at this point. So uh, they are working on hunting. They are probably spending a lot of time doing it. They're probably following the herds around. Um, this is a nomadic period. People are moving from place to place. Okay, they're not staying settled for extremely long periods of time. Um, also focus on women and fertility. So childbirth was probably extremely hard during this time. Um, so an emphasis on ensuring the survival of the human race, making sure that people can continue to have children. So we think that they were probably creating art to ensure fertility, to ensure that people could get pregnant, women could get pregnant, that they could have children, uh, and also that they could hunt, that they could have food. So food, children, very, very basic needs that seem to be the focus of the artwork from this period. So the first work that we focused on um, is the woman of Villendorf, sometimes called the Venus of Villendorf. If you search for her on the internet, she'll come up probably as the Venus of Villendorf. So uh, Venus is the name of a goddess from the ancient Roman period long after this was created. So this is just a nickname for these figures because they're nude. So Venus in the ancient Roman period was often nude. So this figure has gotten that nickname. She's not a Venus goddess, however. She um, may be some kind of good luck talisman, brought, bringing about good luck during the time of childbirth. Um, we definitely see an emphasis on elements related to fertility, elements related to childbirth. Her breasts are very enlarged, very exaggerated, her stomach, her genitalia, um, her thighs. So she's very much a, a female figure. All of her female elements are, are all her female attributes are extremely exaggerated. Um, her face, however, is very hidden. So there's no real interest in kind of her individualizing features. It's more about just this ideal female figure um, that's emphasizing that either she's pregnant or that she has been pregnant um, and that hopefully this could bring about maybe another pregnancy for a figure or for a woman who owned it. So it's very small, only about four inches high, and so you could take it with you. Remember these are nomadic cultures, you could take it with you wherever you were going. Uh, it's important to know that there are terms that come along with describing works of art, um, so you want to go through them when you're looking at different works of art. You want to go through what's the medium, what's it made of, what's the technique, how is it carved or painted, um, what's the size or scale. So as I was just saying, this one's four inches. Some works of art are extremely monumental, are huge. So the size and scale, the composition, how are elements arranged? So is it really crowded? Are things really spread out? Is there something right in the center that's really important? So think about that as you're thinking about the composition. Um, the space. How does the object occupy space? Or if you have a painting, how does the object, or how does the painting give the illusion of space? How is perspective used? So that's very important. Um, what colors are used? We react very strongly to color. Color can um, give you different kind of emotional effects. Um, so is the color really intense? Or is it really washed out? Is it very... Um, pastel -y. it's very kind of light-hearted. So whatever art you're looking at, especially past the prehistoric period where you tend to see more um, pigments, more color added, uh, it's really important to pay attention to that. What kind of line is used? We'll see that in just a second when we get onto the cave paintings. Um, is it just a pure outline? Is there some modeling or shading? Is it very descriptive? Things like that. Uh, and then the texture. Is it smooth, rough, worn? Um, 
a lot of these things are very rough and worn because they're old. So just keep that in mind. Originally, they may have been very smooth. So it's important to think about how things maybe have changed over a certain period of time. Okay. Uh, the next work we want to look at is the woman holding a bison horn. Both of these, or all of the works we're going through here, are key works. They have those double stars. This is a relief sculpture. It's still attached to its background. So um, the sculpture that we saw, the Venus of Willendorf, or Woman of Willendorf, was a sculpture in the round. This is a relief sculpture, still attached to the background. Um, it was actually removed from its original location, so cut out, brought into a museum to keep it safe. Um, it's larger, a foot and a half tall the woman. Um, she's holding a bison horn. Other than that, she's quite similar to the Venus of Willendorf. Enlarged hips, belly, breasts. She's actually gesturing to her belly here. You can see her hand here gesturing to her belly. And then she's also holding on to a bison horn. This is the clear difference between the two works. So um, the bison horn might be a sign of a ritual, might be a sign of a sign of power. Maybe this figure was a figure that was in power. Um, we do, there has been some suggestion, maybe these were matriarchal societies. If women were the one bringing forth life, were they seen as very powerful? Were they the figures in charge? Um, this is very debatable. and It's very hard to substantiate these claims. So um, we're not sure about that. Or maybe were they actually worshipping kind of a great mother goddess? So that's another possibility. Um, but there's this idea that there was an important spiritual aspect associated with women, and a lot of this probably related to fertility, that the women are bringing forth life. So um, we see she's holding this bison horn, ritual, power perhaps. Um, it has 13 lines inscribed on it. You can see these little indentations here. And there's a number of ideas about this. So maybe it's commemorating 13 occasions of something, maybe something to do with hunting, um, but also the idea of 13 moons per year. There are 13 moons. We probably had people that were very familiar with when the moon was coming out because it was their source of light at night. Um, so you have these 13 lines. It could also be the 13 opportunities a woman generally has to get pregnant during the year. So that has a clear fertility association. Okay, we're going to move on to some representations within caves. So we have these sculptures, these relief and in the round sculptures, but we also have cave paintings. And these were elaborate cave systems, systems that went on um, for hundreds of yards. They could be very, very long. Um, and so it gives us a sense that people were going into these really dark places and probably bringing some kind of light with them, maybe lit with um, oil, animal fat. So going into these really dark places, and then they would illuminate these spaces, small spaces, where you might see an animal here, an animal there. And in the case of these Altamira caves, this is a cave system in Spain, so Altamira caves dating from about 12,000 to 11,000, um, we see a lot of bison represented. And these bison, are sometimes, or these bison are sometimes seen as wounded, they're kind of curled up, we have an aerial view of them, um, or maybe giving birth. So another idea of fertility, making sure that the herds will survive, that they will carry on. So um, those are two possibilities for what it could represent. Also, what's interesting about these is the artist chose areas of the cave where the stone actually comes out at you. So you have this curve and it makes the bison seem kind of more alive, um, as if the stone is holding the spirit or kind of the physical essence of the bison. So you can see that the bison's coming towards you. Um, so there's a very deliberate selection, it seems, of where these paintings were going to be. And also I have here noted the word modeling. And modeling just means that you're going to provide some shading or shadowing on the, on the outside of a figure to give it a sense of three-dimensionality. So rather than having a really clean, crisp outline here, you have a little bit of shading along the interior here as well, which gives it a slight three-dimensionality. This is a very advanced artistic technique, so it's exciting to see it at such an early period. This desire to... Um, create a more three-dimensional form. So very, very important. The last key work I want to point out is the Rhinoceros Wounded Man and Disemboweled Bison. Um, this work has three key figures. You have the rhinoceros here with some modeling, uh, and then you have a man. You can see his phallus here. You can see he's wearing a bird mask or some kind of mask. And then you have a very agitated looking bison. You can see hair sticking straight on end. You can see the bowels coming out here. Um, possibly he's been successfully speared. 
And what's exciting about this work is, number one, we very, very, very rarely see humans in these caves, in these cave paintings. Um, so you clearly have a human figure here, um, definitely a man, although he is very stick figure-like, definitely a man. And you seem to have at least two figures interacting with each other, so that's number two. Um, number two reason it's so important is that you have these two figures interacting. There seems to be a direct connection between these two figures here. Um, this figure, the rhinoceros, we're not as sure about, but these two seem to be having some kind of connection. So possibly a storyline could be, you know, this one was speared by this man or by one of his colleagues, uh, and you can see that he's been speared, he's looking agitated. Maybe the story is that this man ended up being gored or, or um, attacked by the bison, and this is being recounted or maybe this is some kind of ritual or something related to the hunt. Um, but some things, this is some key things to know, this is at the very end of a system of caves in France called the Caves of Lascaux, very important cave system. Um, so very, very much at the end. So maybe they're kind of histories or important stories being told over time and added to the cave system. Um, and also people were originally allowed to come in. This really damaged the paintings in the cave system. Um, you can see there's kind of these white growths on the top of the image here. And so now this is closed to the public, but it was very much damaged in the very brief time that people were allowed to come in. So it's important that we've recorded it, that we can see it, and that we can discuss it, because it is such an unusual work. They were allowed to go in, take these photographs, and preserve at least the memory of these images, and hopefully they will survive for a long time after. Um, so key ideas from Paleolithic art, hunting, animals, um, trying to figure out ideas related to ritual, and then of course women and fertility, and trying to determine what the role of women was, um, whether it was related to this great mother goddess, or the idea of a matriarchal society. Lots of ideas have been put forth, um, but it's very, very hard to substantiate these claims from this period, unfortunately, because it is prehistoric, before the time of writing.